Speeding. Okay. All right. How are you doing, John? I'm doing well, man. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing good. Good. Um, thanks for having me, man. No, thanks for coming, man. I I was actually I I wish. I was kind of doubting you'd want to be on this. <laughs> dude, why, like, man? I'm always... Well, dude, you're like, you're, you're working sick, man. Like, you're John. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, for those that don't know, this is like so weird. Like, I'm still getting used to this stuff. But yeah, anyways, that's funny. We have John DeVito, right? That's correct. Uh, John is a cinematographer in the San Diego area. Um, he has a ton of experience. And I think this is going to be a great conversation to kind of hear about what he's doing, kind of how he got where he's at. So... Um, I'd love to hear what's your story from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I did go to film school. Um, I feel like that is worth, uh, mentioning. Um, but I will say on that too, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people say you don't need film school or some people say you do need film school. I don't think it necessarily matters. Like for me, um, I went to Chapman university, which is, you know, on paper, a good film school. But for me, I didn't actually get anything from the curriculum. Uh, that, that was provided. The The best thing they did for me was give me the opportunity to work on set because my goal was to become a director of photography. So like obviously, you know, having that real world experience where I'm actually there and like putting the blood, sweat and tears into, you know, lifting combos and C-stands and just like learning from people who know more than me is the best thing that that ever did for me. So um, that's kind of where I got my start. And I was working in LA for a while and then uh, mostly doing GE. Um, and when COVID hit, I'm from San Diego originally, so I came back home um, and ended up getting lucky enough to get hooked up with a local agency here um, and then kind of made my transition into commercial, you know, digital marketing, social media asset work. Um, and I've kind of just been riding that wave since. Um, I was doing more GE and gaffing locally in San Diego just because I was like, I was like building connections up as everything I had from, you know, my undergrad experience, like those people are all in LA. Um, so, you know, I had that full-time job working for an agency down here, made a ton of connections, decided I didn't want to work for an agency anymore, um, and went back to freelance. Um, and yeah, I've just been kind of shooting, gaffing, you know, doing kind of whatever comes my way since. That's awesome, dude. That's awesome. And did you know you wanted to do this from the beginning or? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you did mention you were curious if I want to talk about my child acting career. Uh, so I did have a, you know, a, a brief child acting career where I had some uh, pretty cool roles, actually, like looking back at it. Um, like I was in an episode of CSI. I had a lot of voiceover roles. Um, you know, I do remember uh, when I was super young, you know, I was like eight or nine doing that stuff. I wasn't the one that wanted to be an actor. My mom wanted me to do it, which, you know, I respect it. Like clearly it set me up for success. Um, but I remember like being on set and just thinking cameras were really cool. Um, and then, you know, kind of throughout my schooling, I got more into like, you know, the like digital media class in middle school type of thing. And, um, the high school I went to had a, uh, like after school program, um, called cinema conservatory. That was a great experience for me as well. And yeah, I think it was something from when I was really young, I've always just like loved cinema and just like, you know, movies obviously. Um, but like the digital medium is always something that's really kind of, uh, you know, interested me. And like, kind of, as of like coming to my own and, you know, become an adult and then like my professional career was growing and all that stuff. And obviously just like the march of technology, like my experience with it has evolved a lot and my appreciation for it is a lot different and like deeper now in some ways. Um, but yeah, I, I would say it's, it's kind of been, you know, for all intents and purposes, it has kind of been a life journey, um, which is, which is cool to think about as well. I mean, that, that's awesome that you got to be on these like really cool roles, dude. Like, yeah. And I remember you never mentioned it when we were, so John and I worked together at an agency. That's how we kind of connected for the first time. Um, I actually, I learned a ton from John and I'm super, nice man. I'm, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad you learned from me. That's awesome. Dude, a hundred percent. Like you were super nice and you were always super helpful. Like, so it was always cool going to work. Cause you know, um, there, there's just different personalities on production sets now that I've encountered. And it's just like, dude, I, I got so lucky with the people I got to work with, but so cool that that kind of like really pushed you. And from the beginning, you were already, already like invested in involved in the whole cinema world. Um, do you still want to pursue kind of like the whole like narrative stuff or you want to stay in the commercial? commercial yeah. Well, stuff? one thing I have really learned, um, and obviously in my professional career, I'm young and we're in San Diego too, where like, if you want to do big work, you got to be in LA, Chicago, New York. Um, the money is in commercials, you know, like commercial work is where the money is as far as I found. And, you know, obviously if you're Roger Deakins, like, you know, he's making good money doing narrative stuff as well. 
um, creatively speaking, absolutely, I want to do narrative stuff, right? But it's not the kind of thing that comes your way as often. Um, I have found with that, you have to seek it a little bit more, um, which, you know, I still kind of try to do. It, it's something that I, I kind of backburnered for a while as I was, you know, getting my feet again in, in a new a new city where I didn't really have connections and getting myself, you know, invested back in where I could like make a living and support myself. Um, I just recently started reconnecting with some of my some of my old directors and trying to see if they had anything kind of in the books that they were curious of working on. But as far as narrative stuff goes, right, that's not, in my experience, that's not work that is really going to find you unless, you know, you're really like at the top and you have like an agent or, you know, you have like a, a connection with like universal pictures type of thing. Um, but yeah, you know, as far as I found for, for like us where, you know, we're freelancers, we work for ourselves, um, you know, supporting ourselves, the money is in the commercial work. And I think as the industry has evolved and, you know, the rise of social media has happened too, it's digital assets, right? Yeah. Um, where they need someone who actually understands lighting and camera and, you know, just framing, editing, the best things you can do um, to create assets that are visually appealing, but also kind of having that understanding that people aren't scrolling social media because they want to be served ads. Yeah, it's like a weird space, I feel like. Um, and like when we were at the agency, right, we would, it was kind of like get it done. And sometimes, right, you're just rush or, and this is like every production, sometimes you're just short on time. And you did what you could, right, with the lighting, with the camera setup. It was like, if I had an extra 20 minutes, I would have done this. This is like every shoot, I feel like. But um, there's a big difference, though, when you look at like the Super Bowl commercials to like, you know, and every every other day, like on scrolling on social media, you, it, there's a, like a big difference in the cinematography, I feel like, where like even for commercials are higher, like these bigger DPs or these narrative DPs, because the work is a little bit more, I'd say more advanced in a sense, kind of like what they're doing. So I feel like that is kind of starting to catch up with the work that now social media is calling for, right? in order for it to be like that good. Yeah, totally. Um, one thing I, I agree with that. I think one thing that the agency where we worked for kind of had a grasp on though, was there's like a level of production that you hit with your quality. Where again, if, if you're intending on deploying an asset on social media, right? Let's say TikTok, for example. And I know TikTok is kind of a niche thing when it comes to social media. Like I think you have to, if you're going to be you know, deploying visual video assets on TikTok, you have to be thinking about it differently than you would on Instagram or Facebook. Um, but again, you kind of have to trick people almost where, you know, you want to make them stop scrolling and often seeing, you know, a super high quality image isn't going to do that for them, right? Like it's more about catching them in the first like second or two with something funny or, I mean, in very extreme cases, I, I have stopped scrolling because I've seen something that's just like really incredibly visual. But when does that happen in the commercial world, right? Like mm -hmm. it's usually some like talking head stuff, some product stuff. Like you're not going to get the most beautiful, you know, incredibly lit artistic shot at the very beginning of a commercial, I would say 99% of the time. That's very true. I mean, and also for people that don't know, uh, we used to do kind of like funny spots. Yeah. That was like all we did, uh, which is super cool because you're laughing half the time you're shooting and sometimes you're like getting camera shake. You're like, God damn, it's too funny. Their writing was great. Their writing was amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, hundred percent. Cause that's like, and then the best part is when you're getting an ad served and you don't even realize it's an ad till the end. And it's like, ah, oh, you got me, but all right, cool. This is pretty cool. You know, rather than oh, another ad. Like, it's just different. It hits different, I feel like. Absolutely. And, and I mean, that's kind of having a pulse on marketing with social media, right? Like, that's kind of the reality of it. As far as I've seen, that's the most success that you can have. Have you seen this True Classic commercial with the t-shirt? True. No, I haven't. Dude, it's hilarious, right? It, it's very much just the same thing. It's it's like a, it's a sketch, right? And it's, mm. it's so funny. And the first, like, two or three seconds is this guy being like, Johnson, you're fired. And it's a commercial for t-shirts. Um, and it's like two minutes long. And I remember I was watching this for like 45 seconds and I was like, dude, this is hilarious. Right. But, but they got me like, I, you know, I work in the commercial industry. Like most of the work I do is commercials, it's social media assets, it's digital assets. And I sat there and watched this and I was like, this is, this is the funniest thing I've watched in months, you know? Um, and like, that's, I think what you're striving for in the current market and like the state of the industry, that's what you're striving for with. Yeah, with, with social it's, media it's funny because like at the minute you mentioned that like the first commercial that kind of comes to mind that like kind of tricked me is uh from De is death water is that the death water right that's the new one the cup my, my oh, I've, 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 i haven't i'm not familiar no i think it's death water maybe i'm getting it wrong but i i can remember this commercial and it's 
it's this water that's kind of being marketed like it looks like beer. Oh, liquid death? Liquid death. Yes, that's dude. Thing. And, it's uh, good water. I haven't even tried it's it. good water. I just, I can't. I'm like, this thing is too expensive. Yeah. But, but I am this close to trying it now from all the like cool shit that they put out yeah. or like their funny ads. But I saw this ad and it's these kids like going crazy in a house. It's like they're partying <laughs> with liquid death. But it's all shot like at 240 frames per second. So oh, you, that's it's, cool. It's, and I can't recall that well, but I feel like there was like a beer pong game going on and everything. But everyone's on liquid death. And it's just like like some crazy stuff. And I'm like, dude, this is such a great ad. Like, it's funny. It's so engaging. It's like, you know, it, it's two meanings between one. Like, it's just so good. Um, I love when the ads do stuff like that. Or well, when we would get to work on stuff like that, it was like the funnest thing. When yeah, like absolutely. Really script and stuff. Yeah, I think you can pigeonhole yourself really easily though, right? Because uh, writing an ad that is funny and having something that actually is really funny when you're scrolling, I think are two different things. Because on paper, you can be like, oh, this is hilarious, right? But like what you're talking about or like the true classic ad I'm talking about is like, they got me in the first few seconds because I was like pretty intrigued, right? Where often I think, and I've seen it with a lot of the stuff that you and I have worked on in the past too, where I think the script is funny but that first for that first five seconds doesn't really grab you, you know. Mm-hmm. Where like if if I'm gonna sit there long enough, it might grab me. But most of the time, that's not gonna happen, right? And it's it's all about that hook. And even then, you know, I think a lot of a lot of agencies are aware that they need their first couple. Like the the gener or generational uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, attention span is non-existent anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think people know that you have to grab people in the first like second or two, but even then, you know that that takes it takes some like real ingenuity to get at this point, right? Because every now everyone's trying to do that on top of the fact that I think subliminally we as consumers know that that's happening too. Like we've seen everything a hundred times, right? Like my Instagram feed is memes. That's all it is, right? And like most of them, like oh I saw this one like three weeks ago. You know what I mean? And like, if you think about it in a, in a context of like commercial and digital assets, it's like, you know, I, I feel like I've seen it all before. Yeah. Yeah. It's like kind of definitely harder to stand out, I think nowadays. Right. Um, but then that's where all the other marketing, right. Comes in like the, the whole story, um, branding building, um, right. Um, like getting into like the short talks or the, the really intensive stories. I mean, Nike does this all the time where they don't really even have to serve you. And not at this point, you already know what Nike is, right? doesn't matter how many other sports people come out. Nike's Nike. Like, it's just, um, it's like a long journey, it seems, to build it, right? But if you want those, like, quick returns or those faster ads, that's kind of where the where you yeah. have to really focus on that TikTok first three seconds of the spot. Um, are you guys, uh, are you looking to produce more content on your own? What yeah. are you doing right now? Yeah. Yeah, just, you mean uh, for my own purposes or just um, kind of like... In production, the... like business-wise kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm always open to producing, directing. I mean, shooting is kind of like my first love. Um, but I think as, you know, I kind of grow in my tenure as a DP and just everything I'm doing, my end goal probably would be producing um, just because I think it makes the most sense, especially considering like as I get older, my body will not be as happy with me carrying combos and cameras around. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, on my own, right? Like just for myself, I'm kind of thinking about how, because so Jesus and I would talk about this before we started, but I don't have a website. Um, I don't have social media. Um, and like a lot of that is just because like social media is just because I don't like social media, right? <laughs> like I just think it's, I just I, I I have opinions on social media. I think like maybe you've seen the the wrong side of social media, and uh, I know I feel like this is like a big thing though in the film community, right? Because not everyone is out there, not everyone. But I get a couple people like when I'll get on shoots and I say, yeah, I'm, I have a YouTube, I have a TikTok, I'm on all these platforms. So I've had people ask me like, dude, how do, how's that working for you? Yeah, like you know, there's like this doubt, like man, I, sh- I feel like I should be doing it. Or, how's it going for you? You know. Um, but like I can say like we were talking earlier right I've gotten some work from like TikTok which is so surprising to me and surprising where the the clients were actually good clients like that's that's the part that surprises me that you're actually getting good clientele from it because I would not believe that (laughs) right and for anybody wondering what we consider good client I mean everyone's client paying clients good clients that's great but especially when they are looking to create 
good visuals and they're willing to put in money for rental for nice camera for lights that's going to give a much production value right higher production and these clients that i've had have done that for me one and they've rented my camera my fx6 and um you know some were like one was like super easy so it's just that but they accepted my fx6 right and that alone is like okay cool the fx6 isn't free yeah i'm so happy these guys are willing to do that because they kind of like maybe have that belief in me from seeing all that social content um so yeah it's so surprising um and before i had left the agency actually i was starting to catch two to three inquiries a week on instagram it slowed down a ton i don't know if something i did different or what's going on or maybe that a lot of that my work is now looking different to uh, the clients because the clients that i was getting at that point was more like uh corporate stuff kind of uh people would have these like talks and they wanted me to capture like a b-roll of that so mm. not the super exciting stuff but it pays the bills right yeah, and i was yeah. saying like at the end at the end of the day right we have to put in so much time into like the the work that pays to get the work that doesn't truly pay in the beginning right uh, but yeah i highly recommend like you know do website getting your website up getting your portfolio up your social media and you don't even have to scroll through social media this is the craziest part i think i've thought about this like i don't like social media because i end up on it all day sometimes and then i feel not good <laughs> uh, the doom scroll is so real bro like I, when I, I have like a million things to do and i'm like oh, i'll just scroll <laughs> and next thing i know two hours i'm like god I needed to delete this app, but th that's the thing. You don't need the app really. All you like to scroll. You don't need to be a consumer. I th in fact, I think it might be even better if you don't consume because your content is literally going to be you. I'd agree with that. And yeah. At the end of the day, that's like the hardest part to do because you, you see this guy doing this thing, that guy doing that thing. You're like, Oh, I can do something like that. And you just become a copy of the people. So. Right. Well, there's also, I think there's also, um, and I, I have an issue with my biggest issue with social media and this kind of goes beyond a professional space kind of into a personal one too, is that it inherently makes you compare yourself mm -hmm. to, to these other people. Right. And I think that's, it's a great point that like, you don't need to be a consumer to do it because I think it just kind of creates a toxic mindset. Yeah. Um, but so it, what I was saying is, you know, I, I, my like journey with my disdain for social media has kind of like grown in such a way where I feel like a lot better about it now. And, you know, especially now that I kind of have my feet under me in a professional sense and I'm confident in the work that I do, um, I'm going to get back into it, you know, hopefully by the end of next week is, is my plan. I'm, I, I want to get the website. So I've been working on a website for the past couple of weeks and it's been so funny too, dude, just getting all of my work together over the past like five years, just like everything I've done. I'm like, wow. I need to do a better job at how, keeping track of this stuff. How many commercials have you done in the last five Oh, years? I couldn't tell you, dude. It's easily over a hundred. Wow. Um, and you've been on like some cool commercials. like. Yeah, um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I've been, on, I, I've been on some stuff that I think is really cool. The, I mean, the coolest stuff that I've ever been on in my experience has been narrative work. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, yeah, nonetheless, like, I'm going to get my website going. I'm going to get my social media going uh, and just try to actually, like, have a platform for myself because I think it's so necessary, especially, you know, just in the current industry and, and, you know, social media is the future. I mean, the future's here, right. But it is the future. And I think it's interesting even to hear that you're getting inquiries on TikTok, on Instagram and stuff like that is such an asset, right? It's almost like, um, people talk about having passive income, you know? Yeah. I feel like that's passive income in some sense, right? It's like, you're just letting your work sit there and people are going to find it because people are doom scrolling. So people you know? might not know this, but I have another wedding site. I still sometimes oh. take. I still sometimes take it. We gotta pay the bills. I took. I took a wedding. I have a wedding in November. I'm sure. No way. Yeah. And, and that you know, no one will talk about this on production. I feel like, and they all. A lot of people do, especially. Um, but at the uh, at the core of this, my goal is to kind of build it to where I don't do any other work and I just sub it. Right. But and that is, is the goal, right? That is, that is the end goal. I yeah. feel like, right? If you can get that to your production or whatever you're creating, right? You could start with just corporates and stuff, at corporate com commercial, like you know, corporate work. And if you get to sub that out, you can then eventually free yourself to shoot whatever you want. Yeah. I, that's how I see it. I don't know if that'll happen, but anyways, that wedding website just sits there, and I rarely like touch it. And it, I still sometimes get inquiries from it. And yeah. it's insane because I'm like, wow, I haven't posted here forever. Yeah. And here's somebody asking me for this date. Um, I don't get a ton. I will say that. I probably would do better if I would post more reels or, you know, actually yeah. stove through all my work and then posted it. Right. But I'd rather do that on my commercial stuff because that's right. what I really enjoy doing uh, for the most part, getting more creative. Yeah. Um, but yeah, dude, it's it's a grind, man. This is like, 
I, when I, I left the agency a year ago and it was just like so many things to do. Like, yeah, even the days that I'm off, this is a, the thing where I'm like trying to find a balance, but I feel like the more I post, the more I connect with people. This, this is the other side of this too. Like I started doing these lives on TikTok, man. And my point of my live is like, look, I'm working full time as a freelancer, cam op, DP gaffing. That's kind of what I'm doing. And I take on some projects. Um, ask me anything. Right. And I, surprisingly have met a couple people that are like in the same shoes as me and they're even like i met someone from like costa rica interesting and then and they're I like saw, how do i get clients no well they were just like oh what do you shoot on or yeah, how, cool. how are you coloring what are what are you editing on and we just chat like even just like day in the life like what are you up to like that kind of stuff in these lives and next thing i know they're like oh dude I, I get some projects over there in like new york i would love to have you there let me get your contact and maybe we can make something work i was like wow yeah you never know man that I, that like already like surprised me from coming from a tiktok live and and these are like i learned on this site had some really cool work and i'm like dude this guy's like shooting some cool doc stuff like yeah hell yeah, yeah. I'm like dude if you're in san diego i'll hook you up i'll, I'll get you crew if, if i can't make it don't worry about it like it's so nice to have connections in, everywhere i mean you never know where the next project is gonna take oh, absolutely you. um so yeah I've, and i've i feel like every live i've gone i've had these connections where I've met someone that's working in the field. And, and I feel like a lot of us don't don't think they are on these platforms, but they are, man. Yeah, I mean, everyone is in some some effect, right? I think I think anyone that you would probably want to work with is in some effect. And that, that's the thing. And my, my other biggest, like, kind of thought of why I, like, kind of try to push more social content is where are the next directors, the next yeah. producers? Where do they spend the time? Not the top guys, right? Because those guys already said they're not looking for work, whatever. But the people that are coming up, right? These guys are going to be on the newest platform, mm -hmm. and they're going to hit up whomever they admire on. Yeah, these totally. I know you. I mean, you see something you like, right? You're going to want to reach out, especially if you're in a, you're like you're a director and you're looking for a DP you want to work with, right? And, and that's what I, why I'm like still like working on this stuff because I, I think that's going to be the next step. Like, right? Once I, I I'm trying to work on some more spec and and trying to like elevate my productions themselves yeah. cuz you know like you know like what you do right half the time you can't show anything for, for a year or 6 months or yeah. whatever so it's like man i don't even remember what i shot 6 months ago i know the turnaround <laughs> is is tough right well that's that's an interesting part about the like kind of commercial world right is like to, so Jesus and i worked on a a shoot in Temecula i think at the end of july right <laughs> yeah so it was like, like, like it was like i think it was the end of july yeah. yeah it was like a month and a half ago I'll call it yeah um i have that now like I have the final asset of that month mm -hmm. and a half turnaround is like pretty quick. Yeah. I mean like, you know, narrative stuff I've shot in the past. I'm not seeing that for three or four months wow. at least, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. It, so the social media thing is super interesting. Right. And like, I know I need to get invested into it now because I think there's something to say about the strikes have really slowed down my work. Um, the recession that we're in is obviously probably taking a toll in some unseen way. Um, but so when I left the agency, you know, I, I made this connection base, but I, I really like took a leap of faith, right? Yeah. I, I worked up until now, I have worked entirely by referral and word of mouth. Wow. Um, and it's not like I, I hit this point. So work has really slowed down for me recently, you know, for the reasons I just talked about. And it just kind of like, I was thinking more about just like my future and kind of like what I want to do. And, you know, it's even interesting again, before we started uh, recording, we talked about some days, you know, man, it's like you're working as a freelancer, like trying to get all this stuff done. And you're like, ah, oh, like it was so easy having a full-time job. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, in some ways, right. It's like, I don't have to worry about paying like quarterly taxes or like, you know, write-offs and stuff necessarily, or, you know, all that jazz. You don't, you don't worry about where your next jobs are coming from. Like you have a consistent paycheck bi-monthly, but I thought about that. Um, and I would still prefer where I am now, like, you know, for example, I think if I was in a position where I was not financially stable, um, I think I would still prefer having that, having my freedom and having kind of like my own control over what the next thing I was going to do is versus having a nine to five Monday to Friday where, you know, someone was like breathing down my neck and like asking me what the next thing was like, I wouldn't trade. I think if I was in a situation like that, I would not trade the financial stability. Yeah. No. And like, I say that with like kind of a grain of salt. I don't, I don't even know if I'm using that phrase correctly, but sometimes, right. That's kind of like the feeling when you, those slow months, but like, like if I look back in my year already, like 
I've passed what I was doing at Rain Job. Oh, yeah. And for me, it's like, dude, this is nuts. Yeah. I work like 12 days a month. Yeah. Like, is that that's, crazy? That's all I, I really go on set at the most, if anything. And the rest is I'm editing at home or on, like, honestly, I could be doing nothing because like it's kind of like you, like I, uh, you know, social media and that Instagram has worked. But again, majority of my work is word of mouth. Right. I think that's the reality of the industry, too. I think it will always be that way in some effect. Right. Yeah, I think the biggest part that I, maybe we're, we're missing, like kind of like growing our agencies or our, our productions, is the the ads running, right? Maybe that will give us a bigger return on like, you know, our, our inquiries or right. kind of the content that I'm putting out there. Maybe I'm not really targeting the people that need my service and that's where it's kind of like falling shorter. Mm. Um, but yeah, dude, like, um, so you said everything you've had was like basically word of mouth. Everything, every single job. Um, how would you say you built those connections? Well, so when I was at the agency, um, and mind you, I moved to San Diego, um, was unemployed for about a month and a half, got the position, um, worked there for two years. Mm -hmm. Um, and, in that time, you know, they, they brought me on in a place where they had just had some really successful videos. They had an in-house production team, but they were looking to grow like exponentially. So they were looking to grow. And I had this experience that I think, you know, they needed. Um, and I kind of came in and helped them grow. Right. I mean, like I was in your interview process, you know, like, yeah, I remember that. Um, <laughs> and you know, stuff like that, where I was recommending equipment, uh, you know, just the best way to go about doing production. Um, you know, I was doing gear organization, just all, all sorts of stuff, you know, and I think I really helped them up their production game. Right. You know, while also working on set as a gaffer, as a DP, you know, whatever. Um, but it was just kind of this thing where we would be bringing on contractors for, you know, odd jobs or whatever. And the guys I met that I really respected, I like made a point to connect with them and like make them make sure they knew that I knew what I was talking about. So like the crew I, I work with have worked with most over the past year and a half. That's like largely paid a lot of my bills, right? Like I'm talking like five or six days a month with these guys. Um, they're probably all, you know, in their like late forties, fifties, you know, it's like an older yeah. crew. I mean, I'm in my twenties, dude, yeah. you know, it, it's an older crew and I, I'm the youngest on that set by decades. Um, but like, I respect those guys, you know what I mean? And, and I think they respected me too, because especially in San Diego, and they used to say this all the time too, is that there's always work in San Diego and there's never enough bodies, um, which is an interesting thing. And that's what I was saying too, is most of the work I had was word of mouth because, you know, largely it was through this group of like, you know, eight or 10 guys that I had kind of proven myself to in a way. And then they wanted to give me gigs back. And, um, there are, there's a lot, San Diego is a beautiful place. Um, and there's a lot of LA based production companies, New York based production companies, um, that fly here to shoot. Um, and a big part of that is that permitting is so cheap in comparison to Los Angeles, you know, on top of the fact that San Diego is a beautiful place and you have a lot of like good, like scenery and vistas here. Um, and then I would just come on working as a local and I found even that, dude, what is going on out there? <laughs> it's the trolley, dude. <laughs> We're really so close to it. Uh, I've found that cause I, I still take work in LA too. Um, I get so much better of a rate working in San Diego than I do in LA. Where in LA, I'm billing for 12, and uh, San Diego, I bill for 10. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm talking like hundreds of dollars in difference of, of, of rate. That's insane, man. I'd assume there'd be like better. Yeah. There. It's just too many people trying to do it. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's, it's wildly oversaturated. I mean, it's Los Angeles. And, um, you know, I haven't been on a union gig in a while. Um, I am not union. I've never tried to go union, but my understanding is that the people who are in the union obviously are like making pretty good money and having that consistency as opposed to people who are non-union, right? Because there's the union standard in place of like, this is the union rate you're getting if you're a first AC, for example, right? And then, you know, you're also, you're getting all the other stuff on top of that. Whereas like for you and I, someone hires us and I'm like, all right, you know, it's X amount of money for this amount of hours. And that's, that's kind of it where we are negotiating that. Whereas Again, my impression, and, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I don't, I don't know. But my impression of the union is that you are not the person negotiating your rate. It's like you're getting the best rate for the gig because you're in the union, and technically speaking, you're in, you're like in the in the group of like the best of the best, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, when I go to LA, you know, people are asking me to work for like 300 bucks, wow. and I don't, I don't take those gigs. 
Wow, you know, and, and and when I do get good rates from from LA based places, I'm like such a dick about it. I'm like, you have to pay my mileage and you have to pay my um, room and board for the for a night. <laughs> so I wake up in Los Angeles and come to work instead of driving two hours through traffic. And most of them say no, and I'm like, yeah. okay, you know, yeah. like I'm just I'm just not going to do it. Um, and, and that is to say, there's enough work in San Diego for me to to be able to turn that stuff down. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, regardless of the fact that like often it's pretty, pretty bad rates. Right. Right. Um, I think it's like weird. I feel like there's like groups um, that kind of hold like their rates in a sense. Like, absolutely. Oh, well, I have a guy that I pay for a hundred. Right. And this is like, say, one group of friends. So I know they're never going to hire me for my 600 day rate. Yeah, I know. At least, right. So I'm like, all right, whatever. Yeah. Well, it's because they don't have the budget for stuff like that. Right. Which almost goes back to what you were talking. Sorry to interrupt you. No, it no, almost no, goes no. back to what you were talking about, where it's like, it's kind of like the power creep almost of, you know, building yourself, building your agency. Like eventually, you know, you going on to a shoot for the day rate plus your kit plus editing and you're charging someone like two and a half or three grand, that will eventually be a bigger client where you're charging them 10 and then you're subcontracting everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. And well, this is like kind of like because I started like a one man band. I didn't I didn't get the film school. I mean, that would have been sick. I, mean, I didn't even like film at the time. I just started with stills. But uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is like it was like kind of like a learning experience. Right. And it was just so hard to even bill for like my lights or my camera. Yeah. Like I, I would hear people talk about that. I had a photo teacher who said always charge the rental for your photo gear. And I was like, man, this guy's crazy. People are barely paying me 200 bucks. What do you mean charge for a little rental like yeah, that? Yeah, man. It's wild to think about, though. And now, like, my perspective has shifted because it's like, dude, okay, like, like let's be real. Like, your, your camera setup at bare minimum is like 3K. Bare minimum. Yeah. I know and, you're talking like an A7S II with the lens. Right. And like, now the rental value of that, it's like 200 bucks now. Like, what, right. fit, like the whole thing, right? Yeah. Like camera, extra batteries everything lenses you know yeah the body might be like 80 bucks 100 bucks but after everything it, it adds up a lot so if if i don't show up and this is how i look at it with my fx6 right if i don't show up with my camera at 250 300 day rate that's kitted out i have lenses i have cards v mounts you know everything you could need supports for my lenses rails whatever and you as a production still will need an fx6 you're gonna go cough like 300 three, four, like 400 bucks i think that's what they go for our voice and video which is our 400 local. a day i think it's 400 really i want to wow. say 400 maybe 300 but i think it's around there three 300 to 400 let's say so regardless if i don't show up you still got to pay that money so if i show up and hey my camera package is 300 bucks like, oh. and they and they get you yeah and they get me like you're saving 100 bucks on my day rate probably right or something like that that's kind of how they run the numbers let's say so it's i've seen it help me a ton and i've now see why i should charge for it right right which like now when i go when i'm pitching for a gig i always now just add my fx6 because i'd rather shoot on my fx6 my quality is going to look much better but i give an option for it if it becomes like a oh money thing fx3 or a74 right i try to kind of keep it within a range but i want a bit higher because I do want it on my FX6. It's like, that's like the gear I'd rather be shooting everything. And I am going to give you the best quality that I can. So, well, and it would arguably be better because you're more comfortable yeah. right, working with that gear. Yeah, definitely. It's, it, there's so much more I could do to the footage than my A7, my A7 IV. So, right. um, yeah. The, the dynamic range on the FX6 is pretty sweet. I, dude, I love it's, it. It's, it's, a, it's a good camera. It's pretty sick, man. I've had some like stuff. Like when I originally got it, I shot something really dark and I was able to like bring it back and yeah. it was like barely any noise. I was like, wow, this is insane. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I did have a shoot though recently and it got me thinking about getting a raw. Yeah. Like full raw. Just for like this shoot that I didn't really col balance my color and it all the color had to be accurate. Mm. And I just oh, trusted myself because I always do it. And like, oh, I'll just fix it in post. <laughs> course and then i i get to post and i'm like this is gonna take me hours yeah, <laughs> and it did and i got to a point where i was like pushing the colors a ton and i'm like oh my god i didn't it didn't really like um so I'm, i was i was on premiere which is my other like case where i need to get into vinci but i was pushing my um uh, my uh i can't think of it like my color picker to change my hue saturation luminance on per color right mm. and that was kind of like starting to crush it and i was like oh. so i had to mm, that makes sense. so much with it to get the right tones and everything it worked out client is happy so that's what matters at the end of the day um but yeah dude it's it's a it's a journey man this this thing and and like you said dude definitely like all my work has been um surprisingly i thought i would get more work from the agency 
uh but like the connections you made no like the agency itself oh. like uh, come cam up come gap but oh for them for them right yeah. and sometimes it is like this month surprisingly i think i have like six days with them really yeah but the other month like i didn't get a single not nothing like the last two months i'd yeah. say so, Dude, I, I mean i haven't i haven't worked with them in a while yeah yeah so it's like weird it's like you know it goes up and down and like last month all i had was my clients with i think it was last month i lost track of this time so quick but that was a really good month for me and and it, it was cool like having my clients and i like our projects right like um it was it was fun it was fun it's just been so much like learning dude yeah I was just on a call with uh, Eloisa talking about all this stuff too. Oh, really? <laughs> I need to have Eloisa here too. Yeah, absolutely, dude. <laughs> um, I, I, I was kind of curious too. Like, how did they hear about you at Raindrop? How, how were you able to like? Um, I had a connection previously. So I the um, the person that currently works. I mean, it's Tom. Mm -hmm. um, I knew Tom from high school. I mm -hmm. shot weddings with him. I worked for him um, for you know maybe a year just as his editor, and he would take me on to weddings when he needed me because his his like freelance journey was that he was like a huge wedding videographer. Yeah. Like his stuff is crispy too, man. I mean, it, 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 of wedding videos I've seen, Tom has always had the best stuff. Really? Um, yeah, he's nuts. I've worked with uh, some associates of Tom and yeah, everyone like, speaks very highly. Oh, man. Tom's, I mean, Tom's, Tom's a really Tom's cool the homie, dude. dude. I Tom's love that a, guy. Yeah. Shout out to Tom. Yeah, there's, there's literally, I, <laughs> I, there's never going to be anything bad to say about Tom. Yeah, no, 100%. And like, I feel like maybe sometimes I, I mentioned like it, may, it might sound like agency life is like difficult, which it can be, but it's also it's true. a blessing, man. Like yeah, yeah. I am more than, you know, happy. I, I love all the raindrop crew, all the homies, but I pretty much went to film school at raindrop. Like, yeah, I knew how to do like one man band stuff, but I didn't know what a spotlight did. Yeah. I didn't know what, I didn't really know how to control like soft light and hard light right. and when to use it. Well, like, lighting, dude, lighting is, is so interesting. Well, that's actually something um, that is kind of been interesting in my journey as well is I think when I started getting, when I, when I realized I was in, in, interested in this, right? Like super early on, just in my life, it was cameras. It's like, yeah. oh, dude, it's all, the cameras are really cool. You know, you're like understanding like ISO and just like, you know, what color spaces mean and just like how all that kind of like plays in. Um, and like framing is so important and like lensing and all that stuff. And then when I started getting into real productions, right, I, I had this like epiphany where, you know, I was on G&E, which means I'm never touching a camera. I'm only doing lighting. It's, you know, it's, it's creating light and shaping light. And I was sitting there being like, holy shit. I don't know how to light things. And I had this whole like epiphany of cinematography is not about the camera. It's all about the light. Right. And then, you know, you kind of go down this rabbit hole of art as we know it, you know, painting, any medium of art is, is based on light. You know what I mean? Cause any, anything visual, right. I mean, the only reason we can see is because light is going into our eyes. Right. And then, you know, you look at, you start looking at, you know, famous, paintings from like hundreds of years ago and you're like ah oh, dude it's so interesting what they've done with the light here and i think that's a thing that is kind of just lost on us especially in the commercial world but i had that kind of journey where i was like it's all about camera and then i was like it's all about lighting and now where i'm at with it is like i'm i i have the full understanding of like i'm like okay these things all matter because nowadays right i could go rent an alexa and a really sexy lens and have the worst lighting in the world and it's gonna look like a million bucks right but it's like Conversely, I could shoot on, you know, an A7S II with a kit lens and light it really well. And it will look super professional, but then you're kind of losing the crispness of having a better camera and lens, right? So that's kind of like where these things play into each other of you can having having the highest end of camera gear is cheating, right? <laughs> but like being a cinematographer is knowing how to light. Um, I think like I would I would kind of like are you were kind of like in the middle. Right, because if, if you have the horrible light, I, I mean, it's all like kind of like intentional, right? Like, cause say you bring the the RLX and all that, but you have the worst light in the world. I mean, damn, the R is just the R. I know, dude. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. It's disgusting. It's I think, cheating. I think the craziest part is on the bigger cameras is the dynamic range. Entirely. So how much you could potentially do with the image rather than the smaller camera, right? Correct. Um, but yeah. Well, and, and lensing is so important there too, right? Like, so so some of. Some of my favorite, I mean, I've worked with Primos before, which are, do you know what those are, mm -hmm. Primos? I mean, in my, in my like tenure, like Primos are the sickest lenses you can get. They're like Panavision, you know and I mean? Like, I don't think they sell them. I'm pretty sure you can only rent them and it's from Panavision. And, um, you know, like big Hollywood films get shot on Primos. 
Um, and I was working with Primos one time and I remember we were like setting up a shot and like, you know, the DP had just set the camera down and it was like an Alexa with Primos, which like, obviously, you know, it's like, it's like the highest end you could pot. It's like an Alexa mini LF with Primos. It's like the highest end you could ever possibly ask for. And he had just set the frame up so we could look at what we were looking at and there was no light yet. And like it, it should have looked terrible. And I was like, this is beautiful. Like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. And it's stuff like that where I realized the the like glass that you have has such an effect on it and do you know what cooks are cook yeah, lenses yeah. so i've worked with cooks before i've shot with cooks before and i notice that like the the quality that it has on skin tones is like really unique um and that's kind of why i picked them for the project and i was like ah oh, this is really interesting but again the point i'm trying to make is that you know you, you can get so far as a director of photography, if you just have a really nice camera and you just have really nice lenses. And then, you know, obviously like you're gonna go on a shoot and someone's gonna hire a gaffer and that gaffer is gonna do all the lights for you and you're not gonna, you might not understand it, right? But you have a really nice camera that's getting you there in the first place almost. Yeah. I'm kind of talking in circles. No, 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 I, I, know, I know what you're talking about. Like I, I totally get that. And, and like, like for me, like a huge surprise me when I first went on set was like, there's gaffers that only light. Mm -hmm. And then there's, yeah, not everyone shoots. Not everyone wants to shoot. And then there's DPs that never light mm -hmm. or don't know lights. And I was just like, right, that this doesn't make sense. It feels me. wrong, right? Yeah. Well, and, and like, I, I feel like the fundamentals are like the biggest things. Right. And, and kind of not having that at, at a, you know, hands reach. It's kind of like nice at the same time because I feel like working with the cameras that I have or, you know, even like reds and stuff like they, they look great. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to like the basics, right? Like the lighting, the framing, what are you trying to translate? Like there's so much that goes into this image, but it's like it's, it's just such a long road. I feel like it's, it's a never ending road. Like you're talking about cooks. I just saw they just released like a new set of lenses. Oh, did they? The, they on like S sevens now. Some smaller ones for. Oh like, yeah, minis. Yeah, which is like, whoa, this is nuts. Like, <laughs> and uh, I'm super expensive still, but for now, for now, we'll see. What yeah. happens. But anyways. Um, well, I mean, if you want to talk about buying like a set of like cooks, you know, you're talking about dropping like 60, 60 grand <laughs> Bro. <laughs> for, like, I'm like, for like four lenses. I mean, there's so many new cinema lenses coming out and like, I don't really work with a ton of cinema lenses. Um, sometimes I work with a couple, but nothing super fancy. Right. right. Um, but even just working with like Helios itself, like you are already see like the big difference. Oh, yeah. It's like the softer, like kind of roll off, like, mm -hmm. you know, less sharpness coming out of an image. Even just throwing like a vintage lens on your camera just gives you that like different vibe on totally. your footage. It's just so different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I, I was so I was curious going back to like where you started. So mm -hmm. how old were you when you were editing this stuff? You were like, you said high school. So you were editing like, for Tom. For Tom yeah. Um, yeah. I was in high school. So I was probably 16. 15, 16. Wow, so you were like pretty much hustling since you were like 16 yeah. then. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was, you know, I didn't even know what he was paying me. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't care. Right. Um, he, uh, I actually don't know what the connection was, but he knew my teacher somehow. And I was like, you know, in, in my like cinema, cinema class, like that I think the teacher liked me a lot because I, I cared, you know, like I just, right. I gave such a shit. Um, so Tom needed a summer intern. And I got recommended for it. And Tom was like, yeah. Um, and he had this like little, you know, probably the size of this place um, in Miramar. Mm. And it was literally him and I, and we each had a desk and a computer. And we would just sit there and I would just edit weddings. Just edit? Just wow, edit weddings dude. five days a week. Dude, that's sick, man. Because it, like, I think I, I, I think it was part time though. I think I was probably only working 20 to 30 hours a week. I Dude, I mean, I was so young. I couldn't tell yet. But dude, but that, yeah. I mean, that's still nuts, man. Being that old and like finding that, like, that's so hard, I feel like. And then uh, on the flip side, like, I feel like a ton of people don't really see how much work goes into this thing, man. Like, yeah. This is like a long journey. It's a very long journey, right? And it, well, and I think there's such an interesting point to be made that it is still an art form. Like, even when we're working in commercial space that is like, you know, so hyper corporate, um, you know, it's not just like you, you like read a couple books or like take a few classes. Like, you know, it's, it, we're talking 10 plus years of tenure of, being on set, having the physical experience, you know, making connections with people who know what they're talking about, who you trust on top of the fact that you probably go to sleep at night thinking about how you're going to get better and where your next jobs are coming from. Right. And it's kind of like, I think it just breeds the mindset of like, eventually you get to this point. Um, and you just have, you simply have a fuller understanding of the art form that you've committed yourself to, even if you're working on it again, in like a corporate setting that 
isn't necessarily the most creatively fulfilling thing in the world. But nonetheless, you have to consider all these things that, you know, two years ago you wouldn't have considered, 10 years ago you didn't know they existed. And it's, it's stuff like that that I think is super interesting. I mean, like even, yeah. even to this day, like I, I, um, I always make a point. I love to edit my own work because it helps me kind of like take a dump on myself where I'm like, oh, I hate this, you know, or like I really didn't like this or like, you know, vice versa. Um, and it just helps me learn how to frame and light better, right? Because I'm physically sitting there. I'm the one that has to deal with my mistakes, um, just like in post-production. Um, I, I forget what it was, but something like very, very like prominent was like, I had like a very like prominent realization with something I was editing a couple months ago. And I was like, oh, like, I got to make sure I do this. I don't remember what it was. But, yeah. You know. no, I mean, that, that's so true. And it's like, I love working with new people all the time, especially when it's like a, like another gaffer or, you know, just new crews because they all like have something, right? I loved working like at Raindrop. I learned a ton from Chris Francis. Yeah. Chris is great, dude. And he would Chris always, knows what's up too. Yeah. And I'd always realize he was catching a, 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 like a catch light in the mm -hmm. eyes. And so I important. Like, Man, I, I never look for that. Never and that's like it. one thing now, like kind of in the back of my head. Um, but it's like things like that. Like I didn't, I wasn't super conscious of it till I heard it. And I was like, that is so true. Yeah. And it's these little things that kind of up your cinematography. And, and yeah, like you said, like you could be doing corporates, you could be doing weddings, but there's just how much are you really shaping the light, right? Like wedding, yeah, you kind of work with what you got there. But corporate, right? You could get that light meter, color meter mm -hmm. and like the next time you're at a building or something like measure the lights and now either balance to those lights or black right. everything out like you know there's so many techniques you can learn yeah to really have control of the light and the colors that are really playing in the scene and the framing there's so many things that you can do to up your game but a lot of people don't do that i feel like a lot of people that i know and this is like even like just in general like everyone that i go work with or freelance with it's like we all talk about spec work or, you know, like a little bit of that. And then no one does it. I know. <laughs> or then well, it's, it's like, about, oh, dude, I would love to work on that with you type of thing. Or it's, yeah. you know, it's people being like, oh, yeah, like, oh, I got so much work coming up. Type of stuff. It's like, okay. Yeah. And then like <laughs> half the people are just like burnt out. I feel like yeah, they just like don't care. <laughs> well, and, and it's an interesting point too, right? It's like I am so much about self-improvement and upping my game and always like improving and just becoming better. And I mean, you are too, obviously, but I don't get that in like a lot of people I work with, you know, like a lot of people are, okay, I'm here, I'm making a living doing it and that's enough for them. And I respect yeah. that. Like, that's totally cool, you know? Um, but I think there's something to be said about it. it probably does burn you out a little bit quicker because it, it can turn into a day job really quickly. I think yeah. if, if your work is frequent enough and, um, you're not really thinking about it, you know? I mean, like I've had, and it comes and goes in waves, obviously. I mean, like if I'm on like a, you know, four or five day shoot and I'm just like a grip, like I, my brain is off, dude. Yeah. You know, it's all muscle memory. Like set up the C-stand, set up this flag, you know, like, you know, put this on the truck. Um, but I think there's just definitely something to be said about like st really studying what you do. And it's interesting too, because, you know, corporate commercial world, I think in some ways I would argue lighting that correctly can be more difficult than it would be lighting, you know, set. Yeah. Like, like lighting, something with lighting, control. like a, like a narrative thing. Right. Because again, it's in the, in the corporate world, you know, like, and I, again, I would say like most of the time, let's, let's say you're shooting a McDonald's commercial. Odds are your ratio is like a half a stop of difference. Whereas, you know, you're shooting like James Bond. It's like five where it's like, he's full shadow, like black. You've completely lost any data and then you just have like a light here and you're shooting into shadow side right so it's just like oh like it's like you know super moody you can't do that with corporate most of the time right i mean nike kind of does that in a sense mm -hmm. as an example um but you, ha you have to have like so much more control over your light and you're also taking into account that you're adding light right and then there's the whole aspect of you need to make sure your subject looks good like it doesn't matter how you're lighting them, what their ratios are, whatever you're doing, you want that actor to go look at the final product and go, damn, I look good. And like, that's, that's something that I've learned as a DP too, is it's like my first and foremost goal as a DP is to make sure that the subject in my frame looks good. Yeah. Right. And then you worry about the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, bro, this is like, I feel like this is like a good, uh, master class right here coming through. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah dude there's like so much like and it's like weird too because i feel like working with different directors it's like different vibes oh totally you know different styles everything's just different but just kind of have to know what to do when the time comes that's right. like the hardest part 
Yeah, dude. Sorry. No, no, no. I mean, I was just gonna say, and to like have the gaffer. Like, if your gaffer is good, then it's like yeah, this is chilling. easy. Just yeah, chilling. you like, uh, what do you think? Oh, this. Oh, cool. Let's do that. Well, it's funny too. Even you know the sh- the shoot we were doing in Temecula. Like, I trust you completely. Mm-hmm. You know, and mm-hmm. and Armando, who is also there, like, I trust him too. Especially if he's working directly under you. Like, I tr- I trust you guys. Yeah. But it's so hard for me as a DP in a scenario like that to not go like move lights around or like touch stuff where I can just tell you what I want and you're going to do it for me, you know? And I'm, I'm so used to like having to have my hands on because building a trust with, with someone on set is, is super important and, and hard to come by too, in my opinion, especially with someone that, um, like really understands you in that way, which I know is why a lot of DPs will stick with the same gaffer for the rest of their lives. Right. It's just right. like you build that rapport and that kind of like mutual understanding where I can say, I want this and you're going to go do it. And I don't have to like, you know, nitpick or, or, you know, like micromanage you in getting that done. Dude, I've had like, uh, I feel like I've probably shared this before, but I had an experience with a uh, gaffer and I was like, dude, I was DPing. I'm like, let's do this. And he's like, nah, I don't like that. Yeah, I'm bro, like, and it's what like, cool. are you talking about? Like, this is like, <laughs> I'm DP, bro. You're, you're gaffing. You we work do, under me right yeah, now. Yeah, we do like, what I want to do. Yeah. Like, I don't, and I don't want to sound like a diva or like, I don't listen to it. Well, but, it's super valid though. Right. Cause like you could tell me, Hey, let's do it. Let's do this. And I'd be like, well, you know, we can do that. But what if we do this as well or do it a different way? I think it'll be easier. Yeah. And you can tell me, no, you know this, we have to do this next. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense. All right, cool. No worries. Yeah. Yeah. It's the collaboration, right? It's a collaboration. Like I want to have a conversation with you. About it, you know? Yeah, don't just come to me. Nah, <laughs> I don't like that. It's not real. It's not how I like. Like the hell, I don't it's care how you like, dude. You're cool. gaffing today. Like it's like about collaboration, and it's about for me. Like when I go gaff, like when I work with you, it's I make your your visuals come to life. Right. Right. Like yeah, I would like my stuff different, but that's the whole point. That's why I can. I feel like I can call myself a DP because. I have like my style and you have your style. Yeah, you like you have your own opinions and, and style, right? Yeah. I have another friend that does documentary. He'll hire me to gaffer him too, like a couple times already. And and I know he hates hair light. <laughs> so I, I never mention the hair light. You know, maybe I'll be like, hey, this is very moody. You want to fill? No, I like it. Cool. Let's Sweet. go. Then that's it. That's the end of it. Like, cause yeah. I'm there to support the DP. Right. And that to me, I feel like, because I've gotten some work gaffing again to other fellow DPs. And that's like, from having that other experience, I'm like, oh, I think that's why I've gotten some repeat work <laughs> with some DPs where like I already had that experience with that the one person. And I'm like, I don't I don't think I'd want him gaffing for me ever right. again. Right. Um, but this is these are the things that are really coming into play with also like what we do. Right. There's like so much of the collaboration that kind of goes down. Um, but at the end of the day, right, the DP's trying to we're trying to make that come to life. Yeah. And there's there's I think there's even something to be said kind of about set hierarchy in that sense. Right. Where it's like the gaffer is trying to make the DP happy, but the DP has to worry about making the director happy, making a good impression on the production team, like all that stuff. And it's like, dude, if you as my, excuse me, if you as my gaffer are hindering my ability to just like work in a consistent and effective workflow, like I don't care how much, you know, you know, it's like, yeah, you could be like, we're working for someone at the end of the day. Right. right? Like it's a, we have to, it's finding a ba- at some point, right? It's about finding a balance between making your client, which as, as you know, in our profession is typically, you know, an agency, a production team, a production house, a director, whatever. We have to find a balance between making them happy and creating an image that we enjoy and are happy with as our own work. Right. You know, yeah. while, while still kind of like meeting the vision that they want. Yeah. And this like comes in play with like the whole setting, like every agency, every company, um, they might, if they have a production team already, they might have something in place where they want, hey, like I want ProRes, I mm-hmm. want you to shoot on red. Like that's kind of like their workflow. So you have to kind of also like ask about the workflow or kind of figure that out. And th- if they've done this before, they'll probably tell you straight up like, hey, this is what we want. And you follow those rules because that's like their workflow. Right. You know, like there's all these things that also come down into how you're going to work that day, how you're going to um, achieve what the production wants. Yeah. But yeah, man, there's, there's so many variables to this, man. I've, I feel like professionally cinematography, I don't know if it's been like three years or two years for me. Yeah. Time just flies. That's, that's <laughs> crazy. So crazy. Crazy. Like since I started doing videos, it's been like five years, probably six years. Oh, I nice keep one. saying five years, but I, I feel like I said five years, two years ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Dude, we're like a, almost an hour. Oh, really? Oh, shit. Three, I, just, I wasn't even paying we're attention. We're just like talking about cinema stars. Straight, straight vibing. Um, <laughs> yeah, straight vibing. <laughs> I would love to get um, like the last... Uh, I mean, I, I, lo I love hearing that, you know, how you kind of got your foot in the door was mm -hmm. really like hustling, man. Like you were young. You were like knocking on doors, right? You got to work with Tom, did a lot of editing for him, went to film school, made some connections there, yeah. came back and through Tom that Tom got to work at an agency. Yeah. Well, it's funny actually on that. Sorry. Um, I, I, cause I had just graduated college and I didn't know what I, COVID had just hit. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, so COVID hit in March of 2020, I graduated in May. So then I'm like, what the, like, what am I going to do? You know? Um, And uh, I saw on Facebook, Tom posted a video. It, it was like a, doc I think it was like a Dr. Squatch video. They posted, he's like, oh, I'm doing this. And I messaged him on Facebook. No, I think I texted him actually, because I saw his number. I was like, hey man, like, just want to let you know, I am in San Diego again. Like, if you ever need anything, if you need like X, Y, Z, let me know. I actually think what I said was, I was like, if you need like an AC, if you need like a gaffer, let me know. And he's like, oh, we're not really at that, like, we're not really like at that level yet. But like, if you want to come like help us out, like, you know, totally. And I went and worked a day with them and he was like blown away with my knowledge. Um, and they, they more or less, he more or less hired me on the spot. Wow. That's awesome. And that, that's funny, like hearing that because Raindrop did have like an explosive growth. They did. Right. I well, know. it was an explosive growth and then like contraction, which is, which is interesting too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'd say like as far as like productions though, they're pretty up there in San Diego. Now. Oh, entirely. Dude, funny enough. I was just talking to someone yesterday that I, I found them on social media and I was asking them some, I was just pretty personal. I get, I maybe I asked too many personal questions, but I was asking him like budget wise, like, Hey man, what do you charge for this? And super chill dude. He, he, I didn't even know the guy. He replied and he told me, and I was like, man, I appreciate the honesty. And then he started asking me, Oh, what are you? I'm like, Oh, I got cam up DP. Um, and he's like, Oh, you ever work with Braindrop? And I started, I was like, this is hilarious, so dude. Funny. I'm like, dude, yeah, I was in house there for like over a year. Uh, I did some Dr. Squatch stuff, and then the guy was like, dude, I've been seeing their videos since high school. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's like, I really wanted to move to San Diego and get a job with them. No way. Yeah, he was telling me, I'm like, well, dude, but this is like the second or third person that tells me this. Like another agency, they were like, oh, we saw your portfolio. We saw you worked at Raindrop. We had to hire you. Yeah, dude, I, I've had, so the agency I've been working with recently too, it was kind of the same thing where um, I actually got my foot in the door with them through a LinkedIn connection, which was weird. Mm. They're a different agency that i like didn't vibe with and then i got subcontracted it was a weird thing um but he he the the like producer that i spoke to he was like oh dude like if you work for raindrop like you know what you're doing and i was like yeah cool I yeah mean, it's like i feel like it kind of like helps out for sure you know well everyone knows them too right i mean they they yeah. actually employ a lot of people yeah. in our in our you know our sector Film. so i've been every time i'm on a new set it's always like oh who'd you work with and i'll be like raindrop and i'll be like Oh, okay. You know him? Yeah. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't know. Like I was talking about this with my other buddy, Chris. It's like a validation. Like, okay, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, totally. Like, yeah, yeah, man. It's like, it's like the circles, right? Like, you're not going to say you know a person if you don't want their name attached to you, right? So right. it's like. Yeah. Um, well, dude, I'm super excited to have you. I feel I don't want to keep you any longer. Yeah. I feel like we could talk for hours, man. I know. It's like, tough, bro. This is fun. Dude. My wife gets tired of hearing me talk about this. So I like realized the podcast is a really good thing for me. Um, especially because the people that tune in like hearing that this stuff, so funny, right? dude. Um, but I, I, I just want to say like, what, what would you ask people to do? Like people that want to be where we're at, like maybe, you know, high school people. And I know I feel like I'm not where I want to be. Maybe, you know, you feel the same. I, I'm not where I want to be. Absolutely. Sure. Not. Like I like my goal, my goal. I'm going to just put it out here. I want to film a movie. Like yeah. I would love to get DP on a movie. I would love to get on, on full feature more documentary work and i would love to get on the high-end commercials but i only want to come in as a dp or if i'm gaffing i better be best friends with the dp because you know i've heard some stories but i would love to be in charge of visuals like that's kind of and i'm sure i feel like you're probably in the same i, same I would route. say all the same things um and yeah like we make a living off of this and it's it's decent good living i'm, I'm happy with where, where i'm at but i feel like you know it's like steps so like the next steps gonna get either on those bigger spots or mm. Or, or see how I make those connections, right? Yeah. But I would love to, I, and, and I, I do get, like, people do feel, I feel like people do see us kind of like, maybe the people are kind of like starting or want to get into commercial space. Let's just leave it at that. What would you recommend them to do? I mean, to be completely honest, dude, um, I think if specifically if you're trying to get into commercial space, there is something to be said about working for an agency. Um, because you make those connections, you get that tenure, right? Like, I would not say... 
I knew things about video marketing when I got hired at Raindrop. And when I came out of that, I say that I do now, right? Because I just do, like, I just understand it on like more of a level. And like, it's even on my resume, like on like just things I send out there, like I will say digital marketing, video marketing, et cetera, right? So specifically with the commercial realm, you know, breaking into the film industry as, as a generalization is very hard. Right. And there's a lot of nepotism involved, especially if you're like, you know, if you want to go shoot the next like Oppenheimer, like there's odds are, you know, you're looking at 30 or 40 years of tenure before you're at that point, you know, just especially considering how oversaturated it is. But I think starting an agency is a really good place to get your foot in the door, you know, to get yourself some experience, to make some connections like working for Raindrop was really good for me. Um, And, you know, I don't I don't like when I left, I wasn't necessarily happy with, with what had gone, what I, what my experience was. Um, but I don't regret it at all either. Right. Um, and it set me up for success in a way that has been very helpful for me. And again, like most of my work is commercial work. And I would largely say it's because of the connections I made there. Um, and I think that's, you know, that can be replicated. Uh, you, you know, like I'm sure, you know, anyone with, you know, like if you can get yourself to an interview process and get hired, even for like a very low level job working in production doesn't really take a lot of specific, you know, skill sets, right? It's, 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 it's so much of a collaboration. It's the willingness to work. It's the willingness, it's the willingness to know that you're putting in longer hours than, you know, someone who works 40 hours a week. Um, And then, you know, that kind of builds into learning camera, learning lighting. Maybe you want to go directly into producing, you know, and like budgeting or directing or whatever, right? But I think having that in-house setting is super helpful and is probably a much more tangible way to approach it. Yeah. Yeah. I I 100% agree with you Um, because like for me, like I said, that, that thing was like film school, man. Yeah. And there's like, it's just such a big learning curve. That even like you might think like an agency has it all figured out. And the reality is no one agency has it figured out. Yeah. No one in the world does. No right? one does. I mean, yeah. and, and even those like kind of breaking in and they're kind of right. Even then, I still tried new techniques there. And I loved having that possibility, yeah. which, yeah, 100%. I definitely agree with you. Um, but yeah, I think this one's like quite long now. I feel like maybe we should just. Yeah, man, sure. Well, thanks for coming. We'll definitely have you back. Thanks, man. I would love to. This is sick.